Hello, welcome back to Station House Cookery School. And today we're gonna to be looking at a basic white loaf. Now, of course, I know a lot of you will be thinking, well, why aren't you doing a whole meal or something uh, a little bit more adventurous? And once you've got the basics underneath your belt, please do experiment as much as you want. But when we're teaching at the school, we find that starting off with a basic white loaf helps you to understand thoroughly about exactly what the flour is, how the yeast works, the salt, the proving, the baking. And once you've got those basics underneath your belt, then you're free to move on and experiment with as many different types of flours and taste profiles as you like. But for today in this session, we're just going to be looking at a basic white loaf, okay? So we're going to start off with the yeast. Today we're using fresh yeast. Please do have a look at my posts on the different types of yeast available to you and feel free to use the one which is appropriate for you. With fresh yeast here, I'm just going to start by crumbling it. Once I've got it crumbled, I'm just gonna add in a little bit of water, just at room temperature is fine. And that is going to activate the yeast. And I'm just gonna look for that to go slightly bubbly and nice and creamy, and it will give off the most beautiful yeasty smell. And as soon as we've got to that point, we know that it's gonna be ready to use basically. So we're gonna leave that aside just for a second. So the next thing that we move on to is our flour. And here we're using a good quality, strong white bread flour. Now, what does that mean? Strong bread flour means that it's got a high gluten content in it. Gluten is a protein, and it's more specifically two protein strands that are present in bread flour. And they're developed by a couple of things. Firstly, the strain of the wheat that's being used. And secondly, how it's grown. So gluten develops and proteins develop in strong, hot climates. So that's why countries, continental climates, um, like uh, Canada, for example, uh, or the very hot countries in the Mediterranean grow very, very good bread flour because it's nice and hot during the summer. And we need that to develop the structure of the bread. So the way that we use the gluten is by adding water, which will start to unravel those gluten strands. And then when we stretch those gluten strands, when they relax, they bond together and they form what we call a strong structure because the walls have bonded together. This is really, really important for bread making because if we don't work that gluten properly and allow those protein structures to bond, when the yeast gives off the gas, it won't get trapped, it'll simply pass through the dough. So you must knead that gluten structure and give it an appropriate amount of time, otherwise it won't trap the gas and your bread won't prove and you won't have that beautiful structure we're looking for in our bread. So a strong bread flour is really, really important. Our other main ingredient is salt. Now, if you forget to put the salt in, your bread is not gonna taste good. This is what balances out the, uh, the acidity in your loaf, and it also brings that beautiful umami quality. When you bake off your loaf and you've got that beautiful brown crust on the outside, if you don't have your salt in, you won't bring that umami quality to it. So do make sure that you get your salt in there. So for 500 grams of flour, we're going in with nine grams of salt. Just give that a bit of a mix. There we go. Now, the other ingredients which you can add at this point, and you'll see in a lot of recipes, are a fat of some kind. So you can rub in butter. Now, what the butter does is it will soften the crumb. So any fat that you add in to your bread will result in a softer crumb. So for example, those really soft burger buns that you can make, actually they're made with milk rather than with water, which will bring you that softer texture. Adding butter in at this point will soften your crumb a little bit. The other thing it will do is extend the shelf life of your bread. 
So if you want your bread to last a little bit longer, then rub in some butter. For 500 grams of flour like we've got here, about 25 grams of cold butter rubbed in at this point would do the job. The other thing that you'll see added a lot is uh, some sugar. And the idea behind the sugar is to uh, give the yeast something extra to feed on, which will mean that the yeast will act quicker and prove your loaf much faster. However, the longer you leave your loaf to prove, the better the quality and the flavor of your loaf will be. So actually what you're looking for is to keep your loaf in conditions when it's proving, which will make it a longer proof rather than a quicker one, which is what we're gonna have a look at now. So our yeast here has been sitting for a good few minutes now and it's starting to activate. And there's a few things about yeast which are really important when it comes to bread making. Firstly, a lot of people leave their bread to prove by a radiator or in a proving drawer or somewhere warm. And you don't have to do this at all because yeast will react better and faster at higher temperatures. However, if it's too high a temperature, they can also start to give off uh, bad tasting byproducts, which we don't really want in our bread. So in actual fact, the cooler the temperature and the longer the proof, the better your loaf of bread will be. So don't put it by a radiator, don't put it in an airing cupboard or in a proving drawer. You actually want the coolest environment possible. You can, in fact, form your loaf in the evening and leave it in the fridge overnight. And so a good seven or eight hours in a fridge is a really good long proof, which is excellent for the quality of your bread. And yeast won't be killed by low temperatures. The only thing which kills yeast is what we call the thermal death zone, which is about 140 degrees. It sounds very dramatic, but cold temperatures won't kill yeast. All those cold temperatures will do is slow it down, but that's a good thing because the longer you give your bread to ferment, the more those protein structures will unravel, join together, and the easier they are to digest. So if you've ever wondered why a lot of people that have wheat intolerances are actually fine with loaves like sourdough or they find them easier to deal with, uh, the reason for that is very simply those breads are a two-day proof. They take a long time. And so those proteins have had ample time to actually form together and they're much easier for our systems to digest. The common sliced bread that you would buy in supermarkets, very often they've been raised in about an hour. And so those proteins have had no time whatsoever to do their job and to bond together and that's why a lot of people with wheat intolerances find it very difficult to use the supermarket breads because they just have not been proved for long enough. So the longer the proof, the better your loaf of bread will be. So now our yeast is bubbling really nicely. It's gone very, very creamy, and you can see lots and lots of bubbles starting to form within that. So that tells us that it's ready to get mixed in with our dough. So my assistant here, Asha, is now going to mix the yeast into the water first. So pop the yeast into the water. There we go. Make sure you get all of the bits in the bottom. Okay. And now that water goes straight into the flour. Good job. It can all go in in one go. If you've weighed out correctly, you should be quite confident. And now mix together, making sure that we get it into one nice, evenly incorporated dough. So in there, we've now got our flour and we've got our water, salt and yeast. And we're just gonna mix it all together. And then what we're going to do before we start kneading is just leave it alone for 10 or 15 minutes. And that is a process which is called auto leasing. Now, auto leasing is a Greek word and it literally means to self digest. And what we're doing there is allowing the yeast to begin to work its magic, to work its way through the dough and to allow the gluten to start 
to amalgamate. And that process will help you when you come to the kneading stage, essentially. How are you getting on there, Asha? Uh, I can't get the part. Doing well? Do you want me to do the last part for you? So we've got a little bit of flour left at the bottom. And we're just going to scrape that. You've done a good job there. Okay. And if we look at this right now, you'll see that the mix is cakey and it breaks apart really, really easily. And that's because the gluten hasn't yet started to work. So what we're going to do now is just cover that up just with a tea towel. There we go. And we're going to leave that alone to Autolise for about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, so now we're about 20 minutes later and we're going to have a look at our dough, which has become a lot more elastic. It's not cakey anymore. It's much, much more elastic. And what I'm going to do is take the dough out and now put it onto the workstation. And I'm just going to bring a little bit of water onto the workstation, not flour. We don't want to change that balance of flour to water that we weighed out very precisely at the beginning. So I'm just going to keep my hands wet and I'm going to get the dough now onto our workstation. So here we can really see how elastic that dough has become, how stretchy. It's not cakey anymore and it's really started to develop. Now, I haven't needed that at all. That's just simply a little bit of time. Now I'm gonna start kneading. Okay, so now onto the kneading. I've just let the dough sit for another five or six minutes, and it's really become really nice and stretchy, and I'm able to start my kneading process now. Now, what we've gotta do is stretch those gluten strands. So the best way to knead is just very simply stretch it out, roll it back, 90 degree turn, stretch, roll back, 90 degree turn. There we go. Now you can't hurt your dough, so you can throw it down onto your workstation, no problems whatsoever. And one of the questions I get asked in the cookery school a lot is how long should you knead your dough for? And of course, it's not a question of how long, it's a question of how quickly can you get to where your dough needs to be. So the faster you turn, stretch, and draw back like that, the quicker you'll get your dough where it needs to be. Okay, now I've been going about 10 minutes now, and I can now start to perform a couple of tests to see if we're ready. And if I hold that up, again, can you see how stretchy it is? And what I'm looking for is what bakers call the window test. So can you get almost like a stained glass window effect where you can see right through the dough, which I can here. That's called the gossamer effect there. And if you can do that, then you know that your dough is ready. As our dough is proving, there's a few things just to remember. Firstly, I get asked a lot, how long does it take to prove a loaf? 
Now, remember, when we talked about yeast, we talked about the fact that at a lower temperature, its activity is going to be lower and it will take longer to prove. This is a good thing when it comes to the final quality of your loaf, but there's no way of knowing exactly how long it's going to be. So beware of cookbooks that tell you leave it for an hour, for example, because they have no idea how warm your particular kitchen is or where you're leaving it. And so you really can't go by any particular timing. You're looking for a dough that has roughly doubled in size and is nice and puffy and light to the touch. It's crucial to get this part right because the yeast has a natural life cycle. Now, once it gets to the end of its feeding, it will stop feeding and it will stop giving off gas and the dough will actually implode on itself. Now, once that's happened, when you put it in the oven, you're not going to get what's called the oven spring. Now, the oven spring is when you start to kill the yeast, unfortunately. So as the temperature rises with inside the dough ball, the yeast has technically like the last hurrah. It gives off all of the CO2 that it can. It goes absolutely manic and starts to push the gas off. Now, if you leave your loaf to prove too long, it won't have that last hurrah. You won't get the oven spring and your loaf won't rise. That's one of the key reasons why loaves, uh, a loaf of bread won't rise in the oven is being to prove, left to prove too long. Now, also, if you don't leave it long enough to prove, what will happen is that it hasn't had enough time to push all of the dough out, giving off all of the gas. So again, when you put it into the oven, it hasn't proved enough. And once again, you'll end up with a thick, dense loaf. That's another reason that a lot of loaves come out and they haven't got the lovely texture that you're looking for. And a lot of people complain of a loaf which is too dense. The reason for that can be not proved long enough or proved too long and it's starting to collapse. So this proving time is really, really important. And don't ever trust a cookbook that tells you just do it for an hour. Okay, so we're back now. It's been proving away for about an hour and a half at the moment, but we're in quite a cool environment here. But we're just about where we need to be. So you can see it's about doubled in size. It's got a lot bigger. And now we're going to take it out, divide it up, get it on the tray, and we're going to leave it for a final proof. So I'm just going to take that out. It's nice and soft and springy. There we go. Oh, it feels so nice. You like the feel of that? And so we're just going to, there, if you can see all of those bubbles which are forming on the dough there, we're just going to rearrange it and we're just redistributing the yeast here. You don't have to give it a massive punch like a lot of books will tell you. We're just redistributing and I think we'll turn this into two slightly smaller loaves. So there we go. I'm going to cut it into half and we're just now going to turn it in on itself. One. And the second one, all I'm doing is just tucking underneath and creating a nice little dough ball there. Now, Asha, can you just flour the tray there for me, please? And as Asha's doing that, I'm just going to give it a few turns. And what I'm doing here is just stretching the top of your loaves. Now I've got my loaves and I'm just going to give them a little bit of a turn like that and with the second loaf as well and that just stretches the top of the loaf okay i'm just going to wet the top of the loaves there we go and Put some poppy seeds over the top just for a bit of decoration and it brings a nice bit of crunch as well. Sesame seeds would work just as well. Okay. And now I'm just going to pop those onto the tray that Asha has flowered for me. There we go. And now you can see what we've got there. 
ready for the second proof. Now, the skill of the baker now is to get just the right point where the yeast is still active, so it hasn't gone through its complete cycle, and but it's pushed the dough up as much as it possibly can. And that is the point where we're gonna get it into the oven. Okay, so here we are. We've leave, left these for about another 10 or 15 minutes, and you can see they've got larger again. They're really springy to the touch, and we can also see little bubbles forming around the outside, so we know that the yeast is still active. So I'm just going to take a razor, make a small incision. If you don't have a razor, you can, of course, just use a sharp knife. And I'm going to get these straight into the oven. They're on 200 at the moment, and after 10 minutes, I'm gonna turn them down to about 180 and allow them to cook on. Something of this size should be the first 10 minutes, and then probably about another 35, 40 minutes after that. So we'll get them out of the oven and show you when they're cooked. Okay, here we go. Obviously at this stage, I don't need to tell you to be careful because they're hot. But we're going to have a look at these, just using our scraper. There we go. Take off one. And then the second one. And now we're just going to have a bit of a test to see if they're cooked. And as always, there's a couple of different tests. The first one, have a bit of a smell. Do they smell cooked or do they, do they smell doughy? The second test, you give them a good firm tap. Can you hear, that sounds really nice and hollow there. And also, do they feel light for the size? So that takes a little bit of getting used to, but essentially when you pick it up, they should feel nice and light for the size. Do they smell good? You smell like bread. <laughs> Fantastic. So now we just need to let these cool, let them come down to room temperature before we slice into them. If you don't do that, they'll still be quite doughy on the inside, so we don't want that. So let them come down to room temperature. They also freeze very, very well. So if you want to make up a batch, simply as soon as they're down to room temperature, pop them in a Ziploc bag, put them in the freezer, they'll freeze ever so well indeed. So there we are, that's our basic white loaf recipe for you. Asha, do you have anything to say? If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button down below and if you're new to this channel, please subscribe and hit that little bell to turn on notifications. We'll see you soon. Thanks a lot.